According to a study published by McGill University, the average Canadian uses approximately 329 litres of water per day. That works out to roughly 87 gallons. What would you do if you were asked to cut the amount of water you used in half? What about a quarter or even less? I'd like you to imagine being told that on a specific date, the taps in your city would be turned off and you would need to line up to receive your allotted ration. What would it look like to try and get by on just 50 liters or 15% of your normal use? According to Time Magazine, that's enough for a 90 second shower, a half gallon of drinking water, a sink full to hand wash dishes or laundry, one cooked meal, two hand washings, two teeth brushings, and one toilet flush. That doesn't sound like comfortable living. But it was the reality faced in a major city within the past decade, a city that serves as an economic hub accounting for nearly 10% of its nation's GDP. On today's edition of Tomorrow's World, we'll look at the water crisis faced by Cape Town, South Africa and other water disasters. We'll look at the potential for conflict over this precious resource, and we'll look to the Bible to answer this essential question. Will we run out of water? Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where we try to identify the problems of today's world, as well as the solutions that will lead to a better tomorrow's world. Water is a resource that we often take for granted. We simply turn a handle and out flows an endless supply of clear H2O. You may prefer to drink bottled water or run it through a filter. You no doubt turn to your source many times a day, likely without giving it a second thought. Could you imagine waking up to an announcement that your city only had 90 days worth of the precious liquid left? That's exactly what happened to residents of Cape Town. In January 2018, when officials in Cape Town announced that the city of 4 million people was three months away from running out of municipal water, the world was stunned. Labeled day zero by local officials and brought on by three consecutive years of anemic rainfall, April 12th, 2018, was to be the date of the largest drought-induced municipal water failure in modern history. Those living in Cape Town had been asked to reduce their water usage to just over 23 gallons per person per day. It was then reduced to 13. The reservoirs did not empty in a day. Warnings were given beforehand and opportunities to avert disaster were presented and recognized, but not prioritized. An article published on nature.com describes how some of the early warnings were viewed. Back in 2009, the models had already flagged a need to boost Cape Town's water supplies after 2015, but officials dismissed the recommendations. Then the worst case happened, a very dry 2017. The purpose here is not to point the finger, but to illustrate that we are susceptible to natural disasters, including drought and that credible warnings should not be ignored when proper preparations can be made. Aaron Baker described living in Cape Town at this time, including many of the difficult choices that needed to be made to limit water usage to only 13 gallons per day. The Cape Town crisis stems from a combination of poor planning, three years of drought, and spectacularly bad crisis management. The city's outdated water infrastructure has long struggled to keep up with the burgeoning population, as dam levels began to decline amid the first two years of drought. The default response by city leadership was a series of vague exhortations to be water aware. The water savings appeals became more urgent in the past year. The rest of us prayed for rain. We'll return to the example of Cape Town and explain how the disastrous day zero was avoided. But it's important to note that this is not an isolated event. In 2014, Sao Paulo, the largest city in Brazil saw water levels in its reservoirs drop to 5% of their total capacity. Parts of the city received water only two days a week, and it was reported that the city was merely days away from running out of water for drinking. In Australia, the millennium drought began with low rainfalls in 1996 and 1997, and by 2003 was considered the worst drought on record. Drought in the Catalonia region of Spain became so severe in 2008 that water needed to be imported by ship from France. As we've seen, the dry conditions faced in Cape Town were amplified by a failure to put the proper infrastructure in place. What about one of the richest regions in the world? 
where state-of-the-art reservoirs, wells, and irrigation technology helped to make the most of the water on hand. Images of the Colorado River and Lake Mead serve as vivid reminders that we in the West are also at the mercy of receiving rain in due season. Nearly three-quarters of California is in either extreme or exceptional drought, considered worse than severe, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. It's so bad that scientists say the ongoing drought in the western United States marks the region's driest 22-year stretch in more than 1,200 years. For the western states, the Colorado River serves as a life-giving source of water for one of the most fertile regions of the world. It provides drinking water, water for irrigation, and an important source of electricity. Yet even with heavy rain and snow in recent months, it's on the brink of disaster. Lake Powell, the nation's second largest reservoir, and one that provides water and power to millions of people in Southern California, has reached its lowest levels since its first filling in the 1960s. Its companion reservoir, Lake Mead, is at levels almost as low. Together, these reservoirs, fed by the mighty Colorado River, provide the water 40 million Americans depend on. In the year 2000, the two reservoirs were 95% full. They're roughly 25% full now. The effects are already being felt as farmland is being left unused. Max Gomberg, formerly of the California State Water Resources Control Board, stated, One of the things that is increasingly clear to people who follow this stuff is that sooner or later, and probably sooner, right, a lot of this AG, or agricultural land, right now is going to be unviable. It won't have water. Already hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland have been left unused without the water supply to make it profitable. If this drought continues, it will affect not only the Southwest, but also many who depend on food grown in this region. We've looked at two instances of water shortages, or potential water shortages, affecting two very different parts of the world. Water is one of our most basic needs. It can be a destructive force through flooding or tsunamis, or when it's lacking, can have unimaginable repercussions. It's humbling to realize just how many regions of the world are at the mercy of regular rain. Droughts, floods, and other disasters are often called acts of God. In part, this is to show our helplessness against them. Yet that term is very instructive. In the next portion of our program, we'll discuss man's ability to create disaster, as well as the potential for war over this precious resource. We've been discussing the vital importance of water looking at two crises that have erupted due to lack of rainfall. I'd like to look at one more water crisis, one that has been developing for decades. Unlike the previous examples in South Africa and the Western United States, this is not the result of a lack of rain. It's an entirely man-made disaster. An article in the Washington Post describes its magnitude. It is often cited as the worst man-made ecological catastrophe in history. This crisis was created entirely by poor decision-making. At the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union needed a source of cotton and chose Central Asia to become its cotton supplier. Though cotton had been grown in Central Asia before, the scale and intensity of the Soviet plans were unique, and the Aral Sea's feeder rivers, Sirdaria and Amudaria, were harnessed to provide the vast amounts of water needed to float this project. But the Aral Sea paid the price for this success. As its volume precipitously dropped, the Aral's water turned toxic for fish and wildlife, not to mention human populations, that depended on them. You may have seen images of large fishing vessels that once sailed the Aral Sea, that are now marooned in the desert, miles from the ever-retreating coastline. You may not realize that beyond just a lack of water for irrigation and drinking, the newly exposed seabed also had catastrophic impact on the health of those in the region. Health hazards emerged as water levels dropped and portions of the seabed became visible to the naked eye. The winds blew across the seabed, producing dust storms that engulfed the area. Toxic dust particles contaminated with salts, fertilizers, and pesticides were everywhere. Many people in the region experienced serious health problems, respiratory infections, breathing problems, throat cancers, kidney diseases, and even anemia. The infant mortality rate in the region is still one of the highest in the world. The danger of water shortage is not limited to thirst, hunger, and disease. With the value of water and the importance of maintaining a regular supply, 
It should not come as a surprise when nations signal a willingness to intervene with force when they feel their water supply is threatened. One of the contributing factors to the crisis in Cape Town was the explosive growth in population. Many of the regions with vast growing populations are regions where infrastructure development is struggling to maintain pace with population growth. They also happen to be some of the regions most susceptible to water shortage. The potential for conflict is high. Take, for example, the Middle East. The Arab region in West Asia and North Africa could become the most water-scarce area in the world. Demand is rising, driven by the region's rapidly growing population, which totaled 400 million in 2016 and is projected to reach 670 million by 2050. Its many political crises are fueled by the region's unresolved water disputes. The building of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in particular has caused immense tension with Sudan and Egypt, nations heavily dependent on the Nile. Throughout history, Egypt and the Nile have been nearly synonymous. It's important to remember that Egypt is the last nation through which the mighty Nile flows. It depends on enough water being left after the other nations have taken their fill. Harnessing such a force of nature is no easy task, but the new Ethiopian dam marks a vulnerability for the countries downriver. Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia all depend on the inflow from the Blue Nile and have long exchanged political blows over the upstream Great Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, GERD project. When the Ethiopian government announced plans to press ahead regardless, Egypt and Sudan held a joint war exercise in May this year, pointedly called Guardians of the Nile. Other sources indicate that the process of filling the giant dam could reduce the water supply to Egypt by more than one-third, devastating cropland and Egypt's economy, potentially resulting in another refugee crisis. How would Europe react to another wave of refugees from the region following the recent migrant crisis? Reuters reported on the recent increase in conflicts caused by water scarcity as calculated by the Pacific Institute. Globally, the number of conflicts related to water scarcity has risen from roughly 16 in the 1990s to about 73 in the past five years. Technology has greatly increased our capacity to divert water flows and harness its incredible potential for producing electricity as well as maintaining vast reservoirs. This increases political uncertainty. No nation wants to be at the mercy of another who can turn the tap and significantly reduce their water supply. When rain falls with regularity, tensions ease. When rain ceases, tensions rise. It is no wonder that many of the promises described in the Bible to the nation of Israel were related to receiving adequate rainfall. At a time when much of the world is increasingly at the mercy of such acts of God, it seems appropriate to see what he inspired to be written on the subject. It has a lot to say about water, its source, its importance, and many predictions which will continue to impact the world in the years ahead. Before entering the Promised Land, Moses was inspired to outline for the wandering nation the results of their willingness to either follow or disregard the instructions decreed by the God who had just rescued them from Egypt. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. As we've seen on today's program, rain in due season is one of the most significant blessings a nation could ask for. The same chapter also includes a description of the consequences of failing to respond positively to God's instruction. And your heavens, which are over your head, shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. One can't help but recall the description we read of dust storms resultant from the catastrophe at the Aral Sea. Throughout the Bible, God has used the weather, droughts in particular, to get the attention of the people. In the last portion of our program, we'll continue looking through the Bible to see prophecies indicating that God will again turn to drought in order to get the attention of a people who has forgotten him. I'd like to again encourage you to take the time to order today's featured offer, Acts of God, Why Natural Disasters. This booklet will be sent to you free of charge. Welcome back. On today's program, we have seen the crisis that can arise when water becomes scarce, including several recent examples. 
and the potential for war over water rights. We also just looked at a few passages of Scripture which describe rain in due season as a blessing from God, and that at times He withholds rain from regions which reject Him and His ways. This is a point that could lead to some confusion, so let me take a few moments to explain and also review some scriptures which show the biblical concept in action. How does this fit, for example, for a nation that has never in its history been a quote-unquote Christian nation? Did those nations never receive rain? The peoples who lived in the area we now call Israel, prior to the Exodus, were described as committing all kinds of abominations in defiance of God. Are we to believe that they never received a drop of rain? Of course not. They couldn't have survived for any period of time if that were the case. During the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus took time to instruct His followers that they had a responsibility to care for those who would otherwise be considered an enemy. The example He gives is helpful for our topic today. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The character lessons here are well worth considering, but beyond the scope of today's program. Does this statement from Jesus contradict the passages we read from Deuteronomy? The world we live in and the universe in which it resides are masterful creations. Even today, science keeps discovering aspects of how our world and universe function that should take our breath away. The environment and systems in place which cause water to evaporate from one location, collect in the clouds, and travel to another region before pouring down as rain are astonishing. The fact that these systems are so finely tuned that they don't require constant maintenance and reconfiguring from God is remarkable. He has set in place a system that allows water to be delivered throughout the earth. And more often than not, that is exactly what happens. That there are times when more rain falls in one area or less can and does occur naturally. However, God's promise to those nations that carefully align themselves with His will is that He would ensure that they receive sufficient rainfall to fulfill all their needs. Conversely, there are times when God allows rain to be withheld from a region as a means of drawing attention to something. The reign of King Ahab came at a pivotal moment in the history of the nation of Israel. The nation had already separated into two distinct factions, the house of Judah in the south and the house of Israel in the north. Israel was slowly drifting further and further from the cultural foundations established with the code of ethics given to them by the great God of the Bible. Ahab was making the worship of foreign gods commonplace and Israel was accelerating a descent which would lead to its ultimate captivity and loss of identity. God used a man named Elijah to proclaim a drought on the land. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. More than three years went by, and the land fell into a severe state of famine. Elijah was given instruction to inform Ahab that God would again send rain to spare the land. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. What occurred next is one of the great stories of the Bible. Elijah challenges the false priests in order to see which God was real. Altars were set up, and both sides prayed that their God would answer by fire, igniting the altar and consuming the sacrifice laid upon it. Baal, the God preferred by the false priests, was silent, while the God of the Bible answered in spectacular fashion. At the conclusion of the challenge, Elijah's words must have been a bittersweet relief to King Ahab. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up! eat and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain." God used the rain to draw the attention of the king and to make clear that He is the only true God. Israel still continued on its course and ended up in captivity. The drought was not used to cause the nation to repent. What it accomplished was to show the people what it is that they were rejecting, the God who could provide for all of their needs. 
the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, a book known for its prophetic importance, states with plain clarity that God will again withhold rain in order to get the attention of the nations that have turned their back on Him. At the time just prior to the return of Jesus Christ, two individuals are prophesied to be used in a powerful way. These two witnesses are given immense power and the ability to preach to the nations. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These have power to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. This is prophesied to occur at a time when the world will already be facing extreme catastrophe. We spent the first portion of our program describing the fragile nature of our dependence on water, how quickly things can turn to chaos when we don't receive rain in due season. War, famine, and disease epidemics are prophesied in the Olivet Prophecy and the Book of Revelation. A sudden lack of rainfall would intensify any of these plagues. At the time of Elijah, God used a drought to remind a once powerful nation of its dependence on Him. Will we individually take note and refuse to take for granted the one who created the wonders of the world we see around us, including the powerful systems which bring about life-preserving rain. This is an aspect of the Bible which sadly is quite repetitive. God's warnings often go unheeded. If the nations of the world would look to Him rather than insisting that we know best, then these prophesied events would not be needed. There is good news. Let's return to the story of Cape Town's struggle with Day Zero and see how the crisis eventually ended. By the end of March 2018, the emergency efforts had provided a small additional buffer in the city's water reserves, allowing city officials to push back day zero beyond the upcoming rainy season. In June 2018, the region saw average rainfall for the first time in four years. With the rain, dam levels rose, and officials were able to call off day zero indefinitely. Impressive efforts from government officials and citizens alike enabled the city to hold out for a while, but ultimately, the crisis would not end until rainfall returned to normal. The right amount of rain at the right time can cure a lot of ills. Isaiah records that after the return of Jesus Christ, he will present the world with a state of abundance, prosperity, and security. One of the methods he will use to accomplish this and to repair physical damage that had been occurred will be through the precious gift of clean water. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. One more prophecy, this from the book of Ezekiel, tells of a miraculous source of water which will be available to the nations after the return of Christ. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. This water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there. For they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. The right amount of water has the ability to drastically improve living conditions in an area within a very short time span. It's one of our most precious resources. When it becomes scarce due to misuse, poor planning, or by drought, its impact cannot be understated. Water is a resource many nations are prepared to go to war over if that's what they feel is required. Its importance will come into even greater focus as the world enters turbulent times ahead. As we saw, drought is one of the tools that God will occasionally use in order to remind nations that despite our advancements in technology, despite our abilities to send rockets into space or explore the bottoms of the oceans, we are still dependent on the glorious blessing of receiving rain in due season. I hope that you'll take a moment to order a free copy of Acts of God, Why Natural Disasters. 
This booklet helps to make sense of some of the disasters we see occur in the world around us, including the effects of large-scale droughts. Will we run out of drinking water? Bible prophecy describes a time when that will be a reality for some, but it will be short-lived and will be followed by a time of incomprehensible abundance. This clear and straightforward resource will help you understand this vital truth straight from the pages of the Bible. Call now or go to TWTV.org disasters. Be sure to tune in every week. Gerald Weston, Stuart Bahovich, and I will continue to discuss the important events going on today and what they mean for you. We'll continue to highlight the incredible hope for your future, the hope found in tomorrow's world. We really hope that you found this video helpful. If you did, be sure to click like, and that's the best way that you can help others to see this video as well. If you'd like to receive more from Tomorrow's World, be sure to hit subscribe and the notification bell to receive updates whenever we post a new video.